Oh, oh, intro didn't play. Hi, everyone. Oh. <laughs> oh, hey, hello. everybody. Well, hi. No intro Hold today. In. That's all right. We'll still do our own intro. Uh, welcome to episode 88 of the GBG cast, everybody. Happy Friday. Hope you're having a great week out there. I am your host for today, Ash Paulson, and I'm joined by a full panel today. I've got Steve Bowling, Brandon Miracle, and Daniel Alba to celebrate the end of this wonderful week. And guys, how is it going? How's 2024 been treating you guys so far? It's Old. a year. <laughs> year, okay. I'll take it. It's 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 one of the one of the years of all time, as you might say. <laughs> Only two weeks in, and it's already one of the years of all time. I mean, what like Discord was like, hey, we're gonna whack eighteen percent of our staff, and Twitch's like, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do it. Yeah. So. Square's already doubling down on AI. On uh, it was like what the first week of the year, and Square's new president was like, "We're gonna double down on how in every way we can use AI in game development." And it's like, man, it's not even a week into the year yet, and already you got egg on your face. Come on, guys. <laughs> Woof. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Daniel? How you doing over there, man? I'm surviving. I'm recovering. Uh, week of jury duty. That was fun. <laughs> That's right. You had jury duty this week. How has that been? Yeah. Dumb. <laughs> what are you, what are you... <laughs> the hell you think i'm gonna say oh it was great no it was yeah. uh it was uh, a time to go there and god the court processes take way too long to decide who's actually on the juror side there's mm -hmm. absolutely nothing that anyone wants to hear about on gbg cast so i eventually got just excused from it so i'm not going there anymore so okay good, uh, good. i can finally catch up on stuff i've been trying to do videos streams i'm sorry anyone that wanted to watch good vibes arcade it was exactly through the time periods on Tuesday and Thursday that I was supposed to be streaming. And so I need to catch up at some point. But I'm here now, at least, doing things I'd much rather be doing with people I'd much rather be around. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I'm super glad to hear that. And, uh, Brandon, how about you? How are your buns, man? How are you and your buns? Well, uh, two of my buns are a little chilly. The other three are nice and cuddly, as usual. Okay, okay. Good, good. I'm <laughs> talking about his bunnies, folks, not his, <laughs> you know, I'm talking about his bunnies, don't worry. I was talking about my buns. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I had a feeling, I had a feeling. We're in the middle um, of a snowstorm right now. It is It is just snowing up a storm, uh, for lack of a better word, outside. <laughs> give me some. Push some over here to L.A., please. I you want, can have all of it, I man. It, please. <laughs> Is this your first uh, GBG cast in, at your new location now? You're not no longer in your dungeon. This this is true. Last dungeon week two point Last week I complained in the post show so much about my dungeon. I woke up one morning and said, "I'm not going to be in here anymore." And now I'm in this room. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I well, I'm I'm going to get my own little dose next week. I'm I'm going to be at Magfest next week, so I actually won't be on next week's GBG cast because I will be in. National Harbor, Maryland, uh, partying it up at MAGFest, and I will certainly uh, host a little mini GVG community meetup for those of you who will be going to MAGFest as well, but it's supposed to snow a little bit that weekend, and I'm just I'm praying that that still comes through, because I need my snow. I don't get any out here in LA, obviously, so oh, I'm the, hoping. I'm at the very hoping. least, uh, to not be completely negative about my week, uh, it did start off better last weekend because I went to see the Sonic Symphony in San Francisco, yes. which was... Oh, much I'm so better sad I missed series. it. Steve, I'm so sad for you, man. I, I, I really wanted you to. It's such an amazing show. Yeah, I, I didn't realize it kind of snuck up on me and my kids were home with me. I was like, I could drive four hours to Seattle and get three tickets. But like my poor kids would have been like, why are we doing this, dad? Like, what are, what are you doing to us? We <laughs> I realized that was you from behind <laughs> and managed to get a, uh, a, 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 a photo with Jun Sunoe. Hell yeah, kind of chill now to the side. Uh, sad I couldn't bring anything to firm the sign. I should have realized. Um, we were there just, you know, hanging out. There was some people saying hello before and during intermission. And I made it, I got a meetup going, just a little meetup. We got like seven or eight people from the GVG community saying hello after the show out, outside. Nice. And hung out for a bit. Um, and just stuff kept happening, man, because I mentioned to you guys the other day, uh, I <laughs> got a DM from crush 40 and the account run by june sonoe because he saw the video i posted of escape from the city um that that whole entire segment that uh, the, of the recording in san francisco and he wanted to have that so i was like mr june sonoe you can have whatever <laughs> video file you'd like 
<laughs> Seriously. I will send it to you. And we had like a just a little conversation. You know, he was saying like, oh, it was he used to live in San Francisco for eight years and he misses being there. He loved being there and he hopes he can come back then soon. And I was like, man, I know how that feels kind of because San Francisco was sort of the area in which I started to learn graphic design a bit more. And that's kind of where he got more into, you know, getting into like really the music of say with Sega and Sonic working on the adventure games and so on. And so that was a that was a nice little moment for me. That was the best moment of the week for me. Nice. And uh, that symphony, man. If you if you're in the area for those symphonies, please go see it. If, if they're always so high energy and totally worth going to see with other Sonic fans. Steve, if it comes back to L.A., you just got to come here, man, and we'll go together. Like you just, we have to make sure as, as massive as a Sonic fan as you are, like the rest of us, you have to see this show. Yeah. You have to. I- I need to. I I do love Sonic, and I really, really, really want to go see it. Uh, if it if it comes back around, I will. Yeah, I just yeah. need to make the time and and the money. <laughs> that, that's also right. a thing. Just need to be able yeah. to uh you know get myself out there. But I'm currently snowed in, just like Brandon. So right. I will not be going anywhere for a little while. <laughs> um, Sonic House, and if you don't like it, the door's right there. So you, <laughs> <laughs> you could have gone if you'd only done just, that. Just walk out on my kids, yeah. be like, gotta go fast, and just <laughs> <Exactly>. leave. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I said, speaking of conventions, I will be at MAGFest next week, so certainly want to have a little meetup with uh, those of you in our community who will be going. Also, speaking of conventions, uh, I kicked off our uh, latest badge giveaway for PAX East 2024 today over on our Twitter and our YouTube community page. So if you're interested in winning a free four-day badge to PAX East 2024, we're giving away a few, and you can find entry guidelines both on our Twitter and our YouTube community page. So definitely check that out if you want to try a score free PAX East badge, and I will be there myself and uh, hosting a, a GVG community meetup as usual. So hope to see some of you winners there. Uh, Speaking of winners, we have a sponsor for this episode, and they are the Couch Kids, the Couch Kids podcast, excuse me, and they have prepped a lovely little commercial for us to play right here. You ready, Steve? Yep. Going live now. Where is Andrew? We were supposed to be shooting the commercial today. I don't know, man. He's probably playing Kingdom Hearts or something. Hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. I was playing Kingdom Hearts. Dude, Andrew, what are you wearing? You told me to dress up. Yeah, dress up like the thumbnails, dude. You know, blue shirt, green shirt. Well, what am I supposed to do now? This is all day makeup. Hey, fam. I'm Colton. I'm Ari. And I'm Count Andrew. Andrew. Sorry, just Andrew. I'm just regular Andrew. And we are... The The Couch Couch Kids! Kids. Every week, you can typically expect a podcast, a reel, and an occasional Let's Play. (laughs) On The Couch Kids, we share a similar mantra to our friends at Good Vibes Gaming. Don't Don't be a grouch. grouch. There's There's always room on on the couch. couch. Except kind of right now, because Andrew's fat taking up half the space what yeah All dude right, are you kidding me find us on social media at couch kids podcast and catch on the couch oh, 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 oh. me. i'm so proud of all of you because i forgot to mute any of you during that ad and no one oh, really? said anything and i was like i was sitting here you couldn't see it <laughs> but like my face was so tense i'm like someone's just gonna be like oh fuck i need to shit <laughs> gonna be like oh no oh well, no <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. No, no, I, I remember from previous ads we've run that just it's just in general good practice not to say anything just in case something like that were to happen. We weren't actually muted or anything. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but yes, they are the Couch Kids, uh, Andrew, Ari, and Colton. Join them for weekly goofs and gaffes as they shoot the biz and discuss all manner of things gaming. The Couch Kids podcast is available for free on all major podcast services, and they also publish excellent content on their YouTube channel. So please check them out at the links in the description right there. I put them in the in the YouTube description. So please go follow them on every podcast service, subscribe to their channel, and just show them all the love because uh, if you like what we do here, they do very similar things. So uh, yeah, please go show them love and uh, thank you to the Couch Kids for sponsoring today's episode. Uh, all right, well, speaking of gaming, I wanna ask you guys, what, what have you been playing? Um, what's What's on the gaming docket for you guys right now? Um, I, I guess I'm allowed to say it. I've been playing a lot of The Last of Us Part Two Remastered because nice. we have a video dropping next week. Um, I've I I built this. I'm so proud of this. So I'm just playing whatever Game Boy games I can get. Look at how pretty it is. Oh, I love it. Oh man, it's <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, so beauteous. I'm I'm revisiting my GBA library. Um. But yeah, I, I think those two things, uh, ironically, I just haven't had much time to play uh, outside of what I'm obligated to play. Um, oh, and I should mention, uh, I did play a bit of the new Prince of Persia. Uh, Ubisoft like 
I nice. asked me if I want to code and I didn't really answer because I wasn't sure. And then they sent one anyway, and I've been playing it on PS5. It's really cool. Uh, thanks to Ubisoft for sending that. I, I'll have a video out about it sometime, but I really want to play. Like, I, I understand there's some kind of like feature that works across versions. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it. I heard it's like you could pick up your game on different versions or you can share screenshots. Somebody knows oh, cool. more about this than I do, but <laughs> I, I only have one so one bad. version, and it's very cool. The the movement looks immaculate in that game. Like I just want to. It looks like it feels great to play. I almost got to play it at PAX West last year. Didn't quite fit it in, but I am looking for. I know there's a demo, and I got to check out the demo at least because I'm not a. I've never really cared about Prince of Persia as a franchise, but this game in particular looks so good and it feels like the 2d the platforming feels good and i see you nodding brandon it sounds like you're in agreement oh yeah this is a game that's absolutely on my radar uh yeah i i'm hoping to pick it up on launch day because i want to play it i'm not even like a big i guess i wouldn't call myself a big side scrolling action guy but just the praise that this game is getting plus just the way it looks from the outside looking in i'm pretty much sold <laughs> yeah nice it, it feels really nice to play. It's it's, it's like 4K 120 on PS5 and 1080p Ooh. 60 on Switch. So it runs really smooth on every platform. And it's, uh, I, I will say, I, obviously for me, it's not as big of a hit as Dread. But Dread is like a once in a lifetime kind of game for me. Um, but that being said, I, I really, really like how this game feels and controls. It's it's really smooth. Nice. Nice. What have you been playing, Daniel? Well, I know you've had jury duty. Anything have you been playing or, or only <laughs> only the jury duty game? Playing the game. The, bit, the biggest thing I was able to play, I guess recently I, I was streaming um, Pokemon Heart Gold. I wanted to jump back into another nice. Pokemon game. And I'll be doing that again soon. Uh, another one I did recently, I was playing uh, some Smash Remix with Brandon, the 1.5 patch. Smash Remix is so cool. And I've been playing a little bit here and there just to kind of reacquaint myself with all the other mechanics and stuff. It's such a good... Um, it's such a good mod. So 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 much passion behind the yeah. uh, behind just even the trailers that you see because there's some trailers in which characters are, are revealed with the same kind of love and attention that Sakurai puts for their character reveals. And this one has uh, Banjo Kazooie was added into it. They added uh, Ibisumaru. Um, they also have um, <laughs> they went back and put in Dragon King as a proper fighter. That's so cool. So good. Is in it. You Mm. And he kicks yeah. butt. He's my main now. <laughs> if you want it to work more like uh, Ultimate, you can set it to be oh, a specific way. That is um, sick. Yeah, you can change this game to feel and and be a completely different game from before, but it still retains like the limitations of that were on the original N sixty four cartridge. And it's just a really good way to kind of reacquaint yourself with this. It's so cool. Uh, the the roster is fantastic. The ones that they demade or taken from like original or from games from now and kind of like demade them for um for smash 64 or characters that were never in the game beforehand like goemon and maybe tomorrow arena uh, for mischief makers isn't it and they're, mm -hmm. they're all as yeah. daniel was saying they're all like in 64 appropriate low poly models it's so cool the it's stages are, are that <laughs> the mad piano and mad piano is one of my yeah. favorites um but yeah it's so cool to check that out and we're gonna be uploading a video sometimes you know brandon and i just playing that so keep an eye out i am working on that as fast as i can <laughs> but it should be out soon it really nice. is cool and apparently there is speculation that 1.5 was going to be the last update but i guess it's actually not going to be so i'm still crossing my fingers that maybe we'll get a d-made Mega Man in a in a future update i'd like to see what he would look like uh, you know, really, the, the only Mega Man game on on N64 was the port of Mega Man Legends, but it would still be cool to see uh, what, you know, classic Mega Man, what they might think he would look like in Smash 64. So I'm still crossing my fingers it might be happening. By, by the way, I've been seeing some, uh, some reports of us buffering. Really sorry about that, folks. Uh, yeah, sure that is that is there. entirely on YouTube's side because uh, yeah. I, I was just checking our uh, stream health in the back end of YouTube and it says everything's working perfectly so uh and usually when you guys when we get reports like that obs will tell me or youtube will tell me but i don't see anything indicating there's problems so i unfortunately i just have mm. to chalk this one up to youtube gonna youtube yeah but... <laughs> youtube gonna youtube um as for what i've been playing i am still completely lost in spider-man 2 and just loving it so much uh you know everything you guys had already told me about how great it was it's absolutely living up to that steve i know you adore oh, it yeah. brandon you told me daniel all of you and yep it's it's fantastic i pretty much knew it would be i'm a little bit more than halfway through now i'm at like 60 percent completion uh slightly more than halfway through the story 
uh, of all the ways that I guess Peter would get the black suit, how it actually happened was not one of them. That was wild. Of course, I'm not spoiling anything, uh, but I'm just having such a blast with this game, you guys. And the 40 hertz mode is just, it's so incredible to behold, just playing it at 40 FPS. It, it, what a looker of a game, everything about it. I'm just loving. played it in quality mode. Quality, so 30 FPS. Yeah. And then what I about for performance? Oh, 60 FPS for me. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that I find, so the, the funny thing is for me, I find that the uh, 40 FPS mode only only looks really great to me on a VRR display because it smooths out mm -hmm. the refresh rate so that it feels like a 60 FPS mode. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a very weird thing where it's like you have to have like a newer modern TV. My brother also has like an older set and he plays in performance mode. And I'm like, well, I mean, it look it, it feels so smooth, but I tend to be the type of guy that goes for that 30 FPS mode that more like I want to see yeah. the visuals pushed as far as they can go sure. in most games. And and that for me, I'm willing to trade off a bit of performance for as long as it's not like I don't want to dunk on Tears of the Kingdom, but not like Tears of the Kingdom ultra hand levels of performance. Right. Well, that's that's why I feel so lucky to have a, a, a display, a TV that's compatible with that 40 hertz mode, because that way, you know, you don't have to sacrifice as much performance right for that visual clarity and those higher end visuals. And I played Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart like that as well. And it was just the way to play that game for me. And Spider-Man 2 is just, is no different. And I have to call out specifically, I know a few of you have mentioned this and you're so right. The flame side story is so good. I just did the third flame mission and I'm like, what the, I can't wait to see how that all turns out. It is peak gaming, the, the, all these flame missions, the, the cult stuff, so good. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, really, really great stuff. I'm still trying to fit in FF16 after I f I'm going to finish Spider-Man 2. I want to try to finish uh, or fit in FF16 before 7 Rebirth uh, hits. That's my goal. We'll see if I can make it. I'm not sure yet, but I am making Big pretty game. consistent progress. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I know. So I don't know if I'm going to quite make it, but I'm going to at least try. So if I have to put aside 16 for a while to, to play 7 Rebirth, obviously I'm going to because once that hits, that's number one for me that's what i gotta play uh but i'm really hoping there's a lull in releases later in the year because i really want to play like a dragon infinite Wealth. but i just i know it's too massive a game to try and play before seven rebirth hits it's just not going to happen and i don't want to put it down and not pick it back up you know for yeah. myself uh i've been juggling rpgs which okay. is weird for me because i don't play a ton of rpgs usually <laughs> like not like like traditional JRPG turn-based kind of things. That's not really my my wave, but here I am playing Dragon Quest V. Nice. Right after playing Dragon Quest IV uh, and Octopath Traveler 2 at the same time. <laughs> oh my God, you're juggling a lot then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I am excited to get into Octopath 2. Uh, Becca generously gifted me a copy because I'd, I I just said like it, it passed me by and I skipped it. And I was, I was happy to like <laughs> just let it go. Uh, but they insisted, and so they provided me with a copy. I'm very grateful. I, I booted it up for the first time uh, last night, and I was just blown away by... I, I was like, damn it. I, <laughs> I feel like such an idiot for not having played this sooner. It's uh, great, I, isn't it? I'm I've trying to get it. Uh, I wanted to get it sooner, like on sale or something, but it just hasn't come down in price. Yeah, uh, same here. And then I... I remembered that PlayStation has a re has a reward program, so I checked my PlayStation Stars and I had sixty dollars in rewards points. Wait, what? what? Wait, what? Yeah. PlayStation oh, okay. Stars you can turn into money. I you sure can. I didn't know that. <laughs> I've I had no idea. I've been using them to buy little digital tchotchkes for my shelf that I can only view I in thought, the yeah. I thought that's Damn what it! <laughs> Every five thousand <laughs> points is twenty bucks. I think. How did you have 15,000 points, my dude? I've never <laughs> spent them on anything. I've just been accumulating this whole time. I buy all my games digitally on PlayStation 5, so it's it's been building oh. up. And I was like, wow, guess what is $60? I don't even know if I have a PlayStation Stars Jeez. account. You have to opt in. Oh, then I don't have one. Damn it. Mm. PSN person. Oh, man, I should have done that. I don't have Did one. Did that on the app? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will say one of the things that I loved... Um, is uh, 
Nintendo, for whatever reason, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know why it's like this, but when you get a review code for a game on Switch, you still get like the the points as right. though you bought the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like every now and then, I would just have enough to like buy a a full price retail game, and I'd be like, I got all of this for free. <laughs> It's it's wow. such a dirty thing, but I'm like I I appreciate you, Nintendo. I bet Sony actually cuts off the points for I don't know if they do or don't. I've never bothered to check, but you right. should you should look if you got I'm, points. I'm, I'm gonna redeem. look. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look live. Let's see what I, <laughs> I I think after tax, Octopath Two cost me like five ninety nine. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I respect what, what the hell out of the one, hustle. An amazing game, too. How do you even view PlayStation Stars in the app? I can't remember. I wasn't but... sure how to do it on the app. I did it on my my console. Uh, um, I didn't even know you could do it on console. I, <laughs> I really need to get back to Octopath 2. That was a game that I, I, I spent about a good 40 hours on, but I just... Tears, uh, Xenoblade 3 Future Connect or Redeem came out, and then Tears of the Kingdom, and I just... I had to set it aside and I just never had time to get back to it, but it is a game I really want to properly finish because it's I, so good. That soundtrack my, is insane. I want to, oh yeah. It's super good. I'm I'm currently on my fifth uh chapter one. Mm -hmm. So like my fifth character. Um I'm currently playing Oswald, who you have to play two chapters of before yes. you can go back. I did his, yeah. Um when I first played the demo on Switch, Oswald is who I went to. Uh, so I was looking forward to getting back to his because I found his story to be really interesting. Um, I'm just enjoying exploring the world, collecting my party members, and just seeing what they're all about. Uh, I'm curious how things change going into Chapter 2 and 3 for everybody because they don't talk to each other yet. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if that's ever going to happen. <laughs> I I heard that the, the character interactions are a little better than they were in Octopath 1 in the sense that there are more of them, not still a ton, like maybe to the level that you would want. But from what I understand, they are handled a little bit better than they were in the first game. Yeah, as it stands right now, like when you meet a new character, the new character talks to you and you just don't say anything. Right. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I came across that too. I think I played like all but one of the chapter ones uh, and then a couple of the chapter twos. I need to get back to it, though. I, I was enjoying it so much. It really is great. I was not a big fan of Octopath 1 mm -hmm. uh, after playing the demo, but this one's got its teeth in me, man. <laughs> this one's less grindy, too. Octopath 1, as much as I did like it, it was very grindy, and I didn't even bother with the end game uh, because it was just ridiculous. I just watched it on YouTube because I'm like, why? I'm not going to grind this out. It's also got a really like comfortable uh, random encounter rate. I'm not being stopped every 10 seconds. Yeah, it does, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's very agree. nice. Any so, luck with uh, PlayStation Stars, Steve? I do. Still haven't. It took me forever to find it. I had to tap the little level icon. I have 10,000 okay. stars. I assume oh. that means I'm getting close. I That's guess 40 bucks. We do have one birthday shout out uh, from one of our patron committee members. However, this one's a bit different. They wish not to be named, uh, but they want us to manifest vibes for Excite Baths, Ultimate Bathtub Racing, which I think we can all get behind. Uh, that kind of game. If that were to ever happen, I think we'd all get behind that. So let's all manifest Excite Baths, Ultimate Bathtub Racing, and happy birthday to you. Uh, you said you wish to remain unnamed, and of course we're going to respect that, but happy birthday, and yeah. hope you had a good one. Uh, all right, well, we got some super chats, because as always, y'all are so generous. And then after that, we'll uh, talk about some light stuff from the week. Uh, but first off, we've got Disney Duncan with a pair of super chats for $7 total. Thank you so much, Duncan. Uh, asking if any of us have seen Echo yet. I thought it was great. I have not seen Echo yet. That is next on my wife and my's list to watch. Uh, we're watching What If Season 2 right now, really enjoying it, and then after that, we're going to try Echo, uh, or watch Echo. So, haven't seen it yet. I assume you guys haven't yet either? No, uh, no, I have not. not. Okay. I've heard good things, though, so uh, looking forward to that. And then also, you said Wish barely surpassed its $200 million budget. Does that make it a success? P.S. I want that world in Kingdom Hearts 4. Um, if it barely surpassed its budget, I don't think Disney would consider it a resounding success. Success, no. But I still need to see it. Um, I've heard okay things. Did any of you guys see Wish? Nope, I'm not really playing. No. Yet. <laughs> I'm, no. I'm so behind on movies, honestly. So yeah, I hear you. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, Duncan, for that. Uh, next up, D with twenty dollars. Uh, no message, but a cute little sticker saying "Thanks for being you." Well, thank you for being you, yeah. D, and for your incredibly generous uh, donation. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Uh, the next up, we got uh, Duncan with another $5 super chat. Thank you so much. Asking about Smash Remix. We were talking about Smash Remix earlier uh, and asking if Smash Remix is N64 based, then how is Dark Samus in it? Well, it's not strictly N64 based. Characters like Sonic are in it too. So it's, you know, it's yeah. not a strict hard fast rule right yeah i mean they have mementos as a stage so they're not mm -hmm. completely sticking to just nintendo and all yeah. that they're just kind of leaning into characters that we might want to see in smash remix or yeah. smash brothers in that in that context <laughs> i hope they had james bond at some point I remember that was like a big big thing for a while like get bond in smash well, it has to be yeah. golden eye you know blocky bond of course but that would if be really nothing, cool if, if nothing else they added the golden gun as an item wow, <laughs> that's sure so cool i didn't know that that's one so shot cool. <laughs> No, oh, nice. Great. It does knock you out in one shot. <laughs> That's dope. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, one for you, Steve, from Shadow Mwape with $5. Thank you so much, Shadow. I know this is gaming news, but Twitch announced something huge in terms of now supporting AV1. Thoughts on this, Steve, as you are more of the tech guy? Yeah. So uh, I don't usually get to talk about this stuff, so thank you for the layup <laughs> here. Um, AV1 is a really cool video codec that basically will make it easier for us to stream at higher resolutions without a loss in quality. Uh, so it's it's really cool. Um, obviously, Twitch wrapped up some other not so great stuff within that announcement. Like they're like, hey, now you can stream at multiple bandwidths and all at the same time to us and then we'll serve it correctly to other devices, which what they're not telling you is you're basically like they're handing you more work to do <laughs> so that their servers don't have to do it because Twitch was already re-encoding your streams to lower resolutions for other people to view on, on lower end devices. Now they're just making you do it. Um, AV1 is cool though, because it means in the future, as capture cards come out that can support 4K 120, uh, we'll actually be able to stream at those high resolutions and frame rates uh, on hardware that isn't like God tier. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's a cool way of future proofing the streaming industry so that we can kind of show you guys how games perform. Uh, which is currently an issue that the the gaming media landscape faces in a, in a pretty big way. Uh, because right now, uh, capture cards don't currently exist that can capture PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X games at their full level mm -hmm. of performance. And even if we did have those capture cards, none of the platforms exist to support that output. Like, if I uploaded 4K 120 footage to YouTube, it would bust it down to 4K 60 because that's the best YouTube could do. Uh, so we're slowly building the blocks we need to get there. It's just really weird that we're like three years into a generation that has all this stuff and we have no way of showing it to you. Like, I can talk hmm. about it in a review, but there's no way for me to let you see it. So maybe maybe they'll fix that eventually. Yeah. But AV1 is a good start. That's cool. I, I, thank you for that super chat, Shadow, because, I mean, obviously, yes, yeah, Steve is the tech guy, and I didn't know any of this, so or a lot of it anyway, so I, it was great getting a little lesson from Steve here on... I knew I knew that we were maxing out at uh, more than what YouTube can show, but I, I didn't know that there are currently no capture cards on the market that are capable of capturing at the maximum output of PS5 and Series X. That's interesting. I did not know that, so thank you for that. Uh, the more you know, Steve, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I will read out any other Super Chats that come in uh, later in the show, but for now, I want to talk about something pretty exciting that happened for Nintendo fans this week, and I want to talk to you guys about Golden Sun, because as we now know, Golden Sun and Golden Sun The Lost Age are coming to Nintendo Switch Online on January 17th, so just barely a week out. And I want to know your what all your pasts are with Golden Sun. Are you guys really hyped about this? Like so much of the of Nintendo Internet is. Or are you kind of like have you played them? Uh, Daniel, let's start with you. What's your what's your history with Golden Sun, man? They announced Golden Sun, and then <laughs> they announced Golden Sun: The Lost Age immediately after. That is incredible that we're getting both at the same time because same these time. two games. They complete one another. They're one full story. This is a game that um, was meant to be on one cartridge, but because of limitations on the cartridges back then, they couldn't do it all in one. So they had to split it into two. And the Lost Age is actually like fifty percent bigger than the original one. That's it's a huge, it's a huge game. And um, if you had the uh, if you had both games before, you can kind of link their the save data together with one another and kind of co continue your story from the original to the second one and it makes a big grand adventure it doesn't do anything that's like super revolutionary uh, at least at the time it was kind of like like this the synergy like the way you can solve puzzles outside of the outside of battle and then on the world map but god it does whatever it does very 
very effectively, and you can see how it, it's influenced games that we see today. Uh, games like Sea of Stars, for example, that has been wildly successful. And yeah, this is the soundtrack is done by Montoy Sakuraba, who's done a lot of music for the Tales of series. I think Golden Sun is where he shines a lot in this. Um, it's funny because uh, I always tell myself that it, 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 to go back and play a game like Mario Tennis on the N64, Motoi Sakuraba also did the music for that one. And I yeah. always think the main menu music for Mario Tennis, it sounds like a village in Golden it Sun. It does. It so does. I'm hearing it in my head right now. You're so right. Yeah. And He, he and definitely has his style for sure. Yeah, I I, I kind of think at this point his style kind of shines more outside of Tales, at least at this point, because uh, it's kind of he's, he's, he's kind of run a little dry on, on on Tales soundtracks. But back then, the well, the ones that aren't Tales, games like Golden Sun, absolutely shine in that. And I'm excited for people to finally play this game. Golden Sun is a fantastic game and series. And if you have any kind of interest in that kind of RPG, uh, please take a look. The trailer does not do it justice. Playing the game itself, it's it's a fantastic experience. Nice. Well, I agree with a lot of what you just said. Uh, Brandon, how about you? How are you feeling about Golden Sun, man? What's your history with the series? My only history with Camelot is Mario Tennis and Mario okay. Golf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as I am becoming more and more of a traditional RPG fan, this is certainly more appealing to me. And being able to play the entire game as a singular package, because they're coming out at the same time, is uh, very, very appealing to me. Uh, yeah. I've heard there's a big 260 character password to transfer your data from one to the yeah, other. Sure I hope it's... we don't have to do that. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's it's a little unclear, but it sounds like the link cable support is being emulated in the NSO release. So it sounds like that's going to be handled automatically. I don't think we have hard confirmation of that yet. Yeah. But if based it's, on if, uh, yeah, but... if it's the same way that they handle the Fire Emblem, the Binding Blade, and the Blazing Sword on the, the Japanese side of the eShop, of the eShop, of the NSO, then it should function the same way where it's just a nice seamless transition, hopefully. <laughs> I don't want to put like that many characters into uh, a one code to, to carry out over data. And then get it wrong. <laughs> and yeah. then get it wrong. I think that happened <laughs> no. to me, actually, because I remember inputting that code my, my my own self, and I think I remember having to redo it because I got, like, one character wrong or something, and it was... It's the real final boss right there. Yeah. Exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about you, Steve? Do you have any history with Golden Sun? Uh, no. I, I, I'm i much like Brandon here. I'm excited to try it. Um, I'm a pretty big JRPG fan. I've just no, not had the opportunity to play these. Back when they were out on GBA, I was broke. And so I, I wasn't able to uh -huh. buy them. So I'm, I'm excited to play them on NSO. I, it, I really wish we had gotten that rumored, uh, you know, Game Boy Classic mini or whatever that that was making the rounds a year or two ago because that would have been a the ideal way for me to play this but i'll take what i could get nso is pretty good now I'll, I'll i'll play it there yeah you have a nice display in that gba of yours now i know now yeah. i just need to touch. daniel send me yep. your cartridges here you go <laughs> <laughs> send me your game boy <laughs> um uh. Malky or seven in our YouTube chat uh, said that the Japanese press release about it confirmed that the code won't be needed. I saw that, but but oh. I was also the the trend the translation seemed to be a little bit uncertain about that. So I just that's why I didn't say full throatedly. Yeah, it's not going to be required. It, that seems to be the case, but I wasn't sure about the translation I read, and it could be interpreted in a couple of different ways. But it does sound like that's the case. So thank you for pointing that out, Malky or. Um, and myself, I, I love the original Golden Sun. Uh, I played it back at the time of its release, really loved it. Obviously, you all know I'm a big fan of that style of 16-bit slash 32-bit JRPG. Uh, as you said, Daniel, it did inform uh, Sea of Stars, and obviously I love that game as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to revisiting it. The more interesting part for me, though, is I did kind of fall off the Lost Age. I don't, I don't know how, how much of the way through I was, but... I got stuck in some really confusing dungeon. I vaguely remember it being some sort of like mountain dungeon with whirlwinds in it or something, but I just got really lost and stuck in it and just kind of fell off the game for some reason. Even though I was enjoying it, I just kind of never made it through that dungeon and just, I guess, fell off the game and moved on. So I kind of want to make that right now. I want to I want to properly play through the entire story as it was meant to be and really finish the Lost Age this time. Who knows if I actually will have the time to do that with you know so many you know 2024 games upcoming but i would really like to make that right because i was enjoying it a lot until that one dungeon just bamboozled me so um yeah i vaguely remember being some sort of whirlwind mountain maze dungeon but do you know what i'm talking about daniel 
It sounds familiar. I feel like that's a, a, par a portion where I was stuck for a while as well. Okay. But <laughs> I had to kind of like power through that because, yeah, there's, there's a lot of in the game does a lot of interesting things and the battle systems are so cool and dynamic with the with the Jin system. You can customize your characters with different abilities and skills that and on the overworld. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there that I, I feel like is unique to that game, even though I mentioned that it's not super revolutionary, but the, the, the stuff that it does do uh, unique to that game is super um in intuitive and interesting and yeah yeah i i hope you can get through it this time because <laughs> we have there's there's you there's definitely a game you have to see through to the end because like the first game essentially is kind of like a, a cliffhanger ending and right. you're just like wait why why here why does it end but yeah now you can do the whole entire epic saga now yeah hell yeah and and uh it looks like a couple of people in youtube chat know know exactly what i'm talking about gamer 1288 says airs rock that's what it's called. And then Mega Haruken oh, okay. said, uh, OMG, I got stuck at the same spot. Okay. So you all know what I'm talking about. Cool. And yeah, air, Air's Rock. That's it. That's That sounds familiar. So, and yes, Wataniac, I knew somebody was going to quote me saying full-throatedly. I heard it as I said it. I, I had that one coming. I walked right into it. I know. Um, I, I always heard really not great things about Dark Dawn. That's the, the DS game, right? Is that Golden Sun, Dark Dawn? Yeah. It's uh, it's okay. I, it's okay. cool that it t it takes place in the future and everything, but it can kind of continues the story. But the first two are the ones that still shine the most out of out of all those of the the trilogy, I guess. Cool. Yeah, no, that's what I always heard about the third game is he can kind of take it or leave it, doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. yeah, I uh, the, the the thing about the Lost Age is even though I want to make that right and finish it properly, I don't feel like I I feel like I have to replay Golden Sun to do that. I don't want to just play the second half, right? I want to properly play the whole thing and that's obviously a big time sink to play both but mm -hmm. if i want to do it i want to do it right so fingers crossed i can make it happen uh but i am glad these games are finally coming back for a new generation of players because they are great great games uh and speaking oh, yeah. of great games uh there's there's a great game that is getting a movie that we saw a few randomly a few seconds of from Sony's CES presentation this week, and that's obviously the other thing I put on the thumb today, uh, the Gravity Rush movie. We were not getting new Gravity Rush games, but for some weird reason, Sony is working on a Gravity Rush film. And as I said, we saw about five seconds from it uh, during Sony's CES presentation. And I want to get your guys' thoughts on this. Like, obviously, I mean, Gravity Rush is great. I loved it. I didn't get to play the whole sequel, but I played some of it, really liked it. But, like, is there a market for this movie? Like, what? If they're no. not going to be making games, like what? Go ahead, Steve. I, oh, I was just saying no. Yeah, there's not. <laughs> like... <laughs> no, right? So like why? And then I guess Patapon was also shown later in the clip, which is also baffling. It's like I, I mentioned this in last week's GVG cast about, why, about how I missed experimental Sony. I missed them doing games like that, like Gravity Rush, like Patapon. But they're not doing the games, but we're going to get movies out of these? Like why? Uh, yeah, I, that's really <laughs> the best. Yeah, it's really right. Did you guys I mean, see the clip? I've not seen the clip. No. Okay, it's it's a short five seconds. I can uh, here. I'll I'll link uh, everyone in live audience chat right now. It's it's just weird. I don't understand the reason for this thing's existence. Really, but kind of feels like certain companies are pulling series out of a hat recently. Like Twisted Metal got a series not that long ago either. I'm just like, who asked for this? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't mind I mean, this Gravity Rush, but it was also apparently pretty these? good. Yeah, like, yeah, where's this coming from? <laughs> yeah, so they're not willing to, you know, to be experimenting or or invest in their more experimental game franchises, but they're willing to turn them into films for seemingly which there are no, there's no market. So. It's just really weird, and uh, yeah. So I, I did post the clip in uh, in live audience, and it just it doesn't even really look like Gravity Rush. It's odd that that this is being made. I mean, Gravity That's Rush early test animation. Yeah, I was gonna say it's one of those things that wouldn't. It, it's a live action film, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Which is just kind of also, wild to me. Which uh, is also they, baffling, yeah. They gave her pants. Oh man. I mean, <laughs> I think a Gravity Rush everything. film could work, but it to me it would have to be an animated film. Like based yeah. on the artistic stylings of the games themselves. It's just mm -hmm. really, really weird to say, Yeah, this one about a girl who can flip up gravity and lives in this fantastical world. Yep, yeah, real people. That's that's this that's the way we're going with this. 
yeah, if you're going to do it, why not making it? I mean, the, the one of the reasons the games were so interesting was because the visual style was so striking. That animated, you know, cell shaded yeah. visual style. Why not make the movie like that? That's just so strange. Yeah, that's that's what kind of nags at me. I I find it to just be a strange choice to make a a a movie that is based on something so incredibly over the top cartoony. Like to me, to me, it would be similar to making a Mario movie with real people, and and we yeah. had that, and we know how that turned out. <laughs> that's true. That is so true. Yeah, so I don't I don't really understand who the market for this is. It doesn't seem to be Gravity Rush fans, and but but then it's, you know how much appeal could it possibly have outside of that fan base too? So it's all very odd. Uh, then there's Patapon apparently, which is mm -hmm. even weirder. I just wish they'd go back to to making some more experimental games in house. I miss that that age of Sony so much, or PlayStation, I should say, so much. Uh, speaking of some something I've missed, in, in this case, someone I've missed, we just got a five dollar, five Canadian dollar super chat from Bongo Lover. It's been so long. Oh, hey wow. there, Bongo Lover. Thank you. Happy New Year, guys. Glad I'm finally able to catch you live. Two more weeks till Ichiban Katsuga returns with his new partner, Drink You Danima. I am so glad to see you back in our in our chat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bongo Lover. Uh, very <laughs> kind of you and. Keep, keep it up. I love the bongo love. I love it. Return of the King says Master of Hamsters. I, I love that. Thank you very, very much. Um, let's see. There's one other thing I wanted to touch on here. And uh, this is just kind of a, a weird thing that happened this week. But speaking of CES, and I posted this for you. I specifically tagged you, Brandon. Uh, AARP had oh, a terrifying yeah. AI-generated Mario hologram at CES. <laughs> oh, have you i know you've seen it brandon have all of you seen this i have okay oh, yeah okay horrendous it is terrifying right like what Bad. i like <laughs> what is even going on there and how Bad. obviously nintendo had no involvement but the fact that they i got call, away I call with bs that, on that you didn't you, you think so i mean so i think that target and nintendo are working on something like this i think it just they didn't anticipate people would notice it, which is a really bad idea. Why would How could you um, not notice that garbage? <laughs> it's terrifying. I mean, because it is it is really out there, like really, really out there to think that you could put both Target Target logo, because there's a Target logo on that thing. Right. And like a 3D model of, of Mario and, and have people talking to it and expect Nintendo not to notice that you did that. Um, I think that the likelier case here is that this is something that I, I can't remember. It's not AARP who is creating the tech. Um, but I think that it is, um, I, th I think it's, oh God, I can't remember the name of the company. It's, it's a really boring name, but whatever the company is, I think that they have been working with Nintendo on a concept like this. And if I had to guess they just don't have a voice model, an AI voice model for uh, Mario's new voice talent. And so they just were like Italian, <laughs> just, just a, <laughs> a deep voice, Italy. cringeworthy Italian. For anyone who hasn't actually seen this, I just posted a link uh, to a video on Twitter in our live audience chat. Definitely do give it a listen uh, it's it's terrifying but it's yeah it's, it's a must hear i i honestly believe that this was a misguided attempt like i think that they've probably either created this as a pitch to nintendo or nintendo has seen and and acted on this pitch probably rejection and um they loaded it up to get people talking about their their ai tech because uh, the one thing i will say when it's not mario when it's not a voice that literally everybody knows it is kind of impressive technology. Like they they had like the CEO of AARP on that thing at one point, which is just hilarious. It's like a really old person. And but it it looked like your grandpa was just hollow grandpa into CES just talking about random stuff. He's like, "My bones hurt." And I was like, "It's actually <laughs> kind of neat." <laughs> 
the clip I posted has somebody asking how they can eat a like a healthier diet. Like what the, what should they eat if they want to have like a healthier living style lifestyle diet? And it's just so the response is so weird. It's and so deep and unsettling. It's scary. Yeah. It's, it sounds like Mario from hell, like projected directly from the bowels of hell into Las Vegas. Yeah. You should eat the pasta. <laughs> <laughs> Mamma mia. God. Oh. I, I wish I could have been there to see it in person. I, I just wild. want Nintendo to add creepy AI Mario voice as like an option in Wonder or something. Oh, that would be great. You, you, you know somebody's going to mod it into Smash. Someone probably already has. <laughs> I hope so. It's oh, so God. bad. Like, could you imagine being a kid and playing Mario and the voice suddenly switches to that abomination? <laughs> Oh, that's like that's like creepy pasta fire. Right? <laughs> Abs- Someone's gonna mod that into Mario sixty four because there's already so much creepy pasta surrounding Mario sixty four. You know that has to be added sometime. Oh yeah, absolutely. You've just willed it. And also, I do agree that it sounds like text to speech uh, and not strictly AI. Like, it, it, I mean, obviously an AI is responding, but it sounds like a generic text to speech voice. Yeah, it does. Uh, and Soulcaster, I just posted the link there for you. Uh, definitely do check it out. Uh, it's it's wild to say to say the least. Um, all right, one more thing I want to bring up really quickly before we move on to our patron topics. I don't know if we've made a final decision on this yet, but we might be having our first uh, reaction stream of the year next week with the Xbox Developer Direct, which is happening on January 18th. Um, or, I'm not going to be here, unfortunately. I'll be at Magfest, but. What do you guys are you guys thinking about this? Like because during the last year's oh, version I'm doing of this, it. we got we are okay, cool. Because last year's we got Hi Fi Rush Shadow Drop announced and Shadow Drop. I, I think we're getting still, it Shadow Dropped again. <laughs> I know, right? For for other platforms, it sounds yeah. like yeah, we talked about that last week. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm hoping we get like a like a, a surprise on that level for this year's developer direct. We know we're gonna see uh, Hellblade Two, Senua's Saga. Uh, and the Indiana Jones, the upcoming Indiana Jones game, and a couple other things coming up too. Uh, Ara and Avowed are also going to be there. Uh, anything else you guys specifically would like to see at this show, at this direct? Silk Song. No, <laughs> I want Xbox uh, to be to double down on their confidence. They're like this year for sure. I know. Oh what, my gosh. Yeah. I, I've, yeah. Oh, good, Daniel. No, that's it. Yeah, I was just agreeing. Yeah, I you know I've been talking to more folks who actually truly believe that Sil- Silk Song has been canceled. I don't believe it. I'm not there yet. No, I, I, I don't think I don't so. Think that no. I mean, to be yeah. fair, people people said all kinds of stuff about Cuphead too, and that eventually came out. Right, that's true. I think it's coming. It's just they're taking obviously they're I, the time to get it right. I think the problem is Microsoft um, doesn't doesn't know how to maybe accurately gauge progress at indie studios because they did the same thing with Cuphead. They're like, coming soon. Yeah. In three years. So I remember playing Cuphead at E3 and they're like, comes out in six months. I was like, this is really incredible. I can't wait. And I I played it like four and a half years later. (laughs) So I think it's just an issue of like, I don't know, maybe there's some communication issues or maybe there's a little bit too much trust or, or whatever. I don't know. But Microsoft uh, definitely doesn't know how to put that pin accurately in the calendar for their indie devs. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, it'll be really interesting to see what's there beyond what we already know about. I do hope we get a really cool surprise that we got with Hi-Fi Rush last year. Um, it, 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 it would be hard to top that for me just because that game, it was so right up my alley and it was just so everything that I'm all about. But I'm hoping we get a cool surprise. Um, <laughs> I've seen a couple of people saying Banjo-Kazooie Apparently something's in development, but I don't think we're going to see no it way. this year or maybe ever. Disney but apparently like there's something. According to Nate Drake, who has a pretty good track record, there's something going on behind the scenes, but it's not this year. I think it's still barely exited pre-production, actually. So I'm, I don't think we're going to see anything Banjo. I'm honestly thinking that it's going to be a quiet year from Xbox. Uh, mm-hmm. We already know, unfortunately, thanks to... Well, you know what? Not unfortunately, because Microsoft did it to themselves. They didn't redact their own court slides. So I don't feel right. bad for them necessarily. Um, we already know that they have lots of hardware lined up for this year that's like iterative on the series. Um, but I think that this is, I think they're going to pull a Wii U and rip the rug out from under the series consoles next year. And then be mm-hmm. like, we're, we're we're packing it in and we're making something new because this isn't working. Mm-hmm. Um but this year, I expect them to be 
typically quiet at this point and just they're probably focusing on launch lineup for whatever their next big hardware is uh because they've got they at this point i think it's time to throw in the towel with the series consoles and just accept that you you, you took a pretty big l this generation and you need to regroup and come up with something that people are more interested in because i think we saw what ps5 outselling it three to one at this point mm-hmm. i believe so mm-hmm. yeah well, and, and, you know, part of the issue, too, is that they've they've focused so heavily on Game Pass, which has obviously worked out for the worked out for them in one manner. But on the other hand, de-emphasizing the hardware the way they have has had kind of a knock on effect where we've seen sales really struggling with the series consoles. So, yeah, yeah. I don't really attribute Xbox to any particular identity anymore. And right. That's true. That's that's harming the brand, I think, because mm-hmm. I don't have any reason to go to Xbox for anything, really. Like other than Game Pass, and I play Game Pass on my PC. <laughs> I have very yeah. specific uses for my Series X, which I, I definitely you know appreciate it for. Like I have certain access to back backwards compatible games that are otherwise stuck on like PS3, which I don't have you know hooked up anymore. Like Knights HD, for example. Um, I Knights is one of my favorite games of all time, and I can play that via Xbox Live Arcade backward compatibility. Uh, same thing with other very specific things like FPS boost for games like Sonic Generations, Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. So like it has its very specific uses that I really appreciate having one for. But yeah, outside of that, it's just kind of has such a nebulous identity now. Well, I, I don't necessarily think that it's to me, it's not an issue of identity. It's more uh, that their exclusives that they have made have universally failed to land. And mm-hmm. like if Starfield was amazing, like universally lauded, everybody liked it, people would associate Xbox with it. But because for a lot of people, it felt like very dated and, and didn't really hit people. People don't think, oh, there's you know, there isn't a an experience that you can only have on Xbox. that's super compelling right now. And. You know, like Brandon said, Game Pass is is really the major product they have now. That's their platform. Um, but again, it's like when I think of a multi-platform game, it used to be in previous generations, I would fire up Digital Foundry and see which one they said was best. And then I'd yeah. buy that one. Uh, now it's just um, I automatically assume that I'm going to be playing it on PS5 unless yeah. I start hearing like, whoa, it's, it's way better on Xbox, which is almost never the case. So... Uh, these days, I almost feel confident just pre-ordering a multi-plat on PS5 and just hoping for the best, which which is right. not at all yeah. what I would have said last generation. Right. I mean, that's a great point. And, and like you were saying, there are no really compelling exclusives that you can only play on Xbox. Like even Hi-Fi Rush was available on PC from day one as well, uh, PC Game Pass. So, yeah, there's not which something... Which is where I played it. <laughs> right. That's where I did our launch stream of it, too, through PC Game Pass. So... Yeah, it's true. I they seem to, to have kind of lost their direction this gen, and it's it. Yeah, you could be right, Steve. Maybe we're we're due for a refresh sooner than we sooner than sooner rather than later, I should say. Yeah. But uh, cool. Well, it does sound like we're going to be doing a reaction stream to that next week. So look forward to that. I will be with you here in spirit. I'll be following the announcements from Magfest. Uh, before we move on to our patron topics for the week, we got one super chat from Colt D from the Couch Kids for ten dollars. Thank you so much, Colton. Odd, Sony would take a visually stunning game like Gravity Rush and ground it in live action. So much potential for it to be an anime film, thinking Dragon Quest, your story meets Spider-Verse from Colton of the Couch Kids. A Spider-Verse style animated Gravity Rush film would break my brain. That would oh, be, I'd love why that. not, why wouldn't you do that? Oh, why? Yeah. Oh, I don't want a live action Gravity Rush. I want it even less now. That sounds perfect. Well, thank you for that, <laughs> Colton. Seriously, we really appreciate you. And uh, now... It is time for our patron topics. And as a reminder, we have a Patreon and we have a YouTube members page. If you support us at the producer tier or above, you can suggest topics just like the ones we're about to discuss right now. And Brandon, why don't you get us started while the LA hype police drives right by my apartment? They sure it's intense are. today. <laughs> <laughs> so my topic comes from Whoa. Whoa. Jesus, what is what? going on? Are they like in your they apartment? Breaking in or what? 
<laughs> like that oh, got incredibly God. loud. Yeah, that's that actually startled the crap out of me. I'm oh, sorry, man. listener. Sorry, guys. Jeez, I don't know please. what's going on over here. Jeez. Yeah, your mic got really loud just in time for that to happen. <laughs> I, I don't. I didn't change my mic setting, so I don't know what happened there. No, because you got <laughs> yeah. loud too. Oh, yeah. I, I felt my heart jump. I was like, oh my god. Sorry, so he's right here. Not too soon. I got arrested right. on stream. <laughs> Jesus, sorry. Oh boy. Somebody's swatting right. ash right now. Well, the hype police are gone, so we are good to go. Please, I don't Ooh. want to go back to court. Stop it. Right? <laughs> Daniel's yeah. on shirt. <laughs> so my, my patron topic comes from Bedron asking, what is your most wanted sequel for a game that released within the last decade that hasn't gotten one yet? Um, This might be a weird pick, but it's mm. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. <laughs> oh, okay. I really want another Hyrule Warriors based on Tears of the Kingdom, hopefully on the next platform, so it doesn't run like doo-doo. Um, that would be cool. But yeah, I really liked Age of Calamity. I 100%ed that game, and I'd love to do it again with a sequel. So true. Didn't you, didn't you play that game two-player to very... I <laughs> very wanted to de play depressing, it. Very depressing yeah. outcomes. <laughs> I wanted to play it two-player with Michaela, and we were getting like nine fps <laughs> yeah, and after like were. the first couple of matches she was like you can just play this by yourself i don't want yeah. to ruin your experience with this Aww. which uh i graciously accepted the offer because it really was quite bad <laughs> yeah i uh you just but despite the horrendous performance issues and they were horrendous i that is actually the only high warriors game i've ever 100 it i couldn't get enough of it despite the performance problems and yeah i'd love to see more and i'd love to play it on a on a more powerful switch as well just to see that game would sing at 60 fps wouldn't it it would just sing and that would be really yes cool. yes please. yeah it's a yeah it's a much more digestible warriors game to get 100 percent in compared to like the original Hyper warriors which you could you could probably play that for like hundreds and hundreds of hours and still not get anywhere near 100 percent completion but yeah i, I love the original uh, not the original but Age, Age of Calamity. Uh, the DLC that came out with it was also a lot of fun too. You got like Pura and Robbie on a team. You got Zelda on a bike on the the Master Cycle, which was incredible. Yeah, and the, I feel like not playable people... big guardian. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and playing as all the champions was so cool. I loved playing as Mifa. She was so OP, and I loved it. <laughs> what about you, Steve? I'm gonna make all of us feel bad right now. I okay. want a sequel to Arms, which is seven years old. Uh, no, not yeah. no to oh. Arms. No to seven years old. I yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Ar arms old. is like a top tier fighting game, and I don't think it gets enough respect from actual like hardcore fight heads because the the mind games that one has to employ to play Arms are are ridiculous. Like Nintendo simplified and distilled the meta of most fighting games into like this extremely easy to grasp experience and every time i play it it's just so incredibly tense and fun and you don't need like a in-depth knowledge of fighters to be able to have a good time with arms yeah. so that to me would be the uh my pick i just played it with azran for a fight a founder like last week or this week even and i had a blast i forgot how much i enjoy that game we need that. I was also going to say Persona 5, but I haven't played that. That's not fair. That's also <laughs> seven years old. Kill me now. That's crazy. Jeez. Our arms is great, though. I'm not particularly good at it, but it doesn't really matter. Like, whenever we play it for our EP squad hangouts as a group, I always have a great time, regardless. That game exudes vibes. That game is just yeah. vibes. <laughs> yes. It really is. It really does. Uh, what about you, Daniel? Um... Gosh, I feel like I've said this before, but I want to see a sequel to uh, Project Cross Zone. Oh, we have Project nice. Cross Zone 2 on the 3DS, and I still want to see what they can do with that. They have It's a crossover with Bandai Namco, with Sega, with Capcom, and also some guest characters from Nintendo, which has some really crazy uh, uh, mix and matches. for. I, I love crossover games to see worlds collide. And you have a lot of more options now. You could put uh, introductions to like the great Ace Attorney into this in some way or shape or form. Um, new new characters introduced with like Sonic Frontiers, um, because I want to see <laughs> I want to see more I want to see Sonic in that in general, um, mm -hmm. and then whatever else they want to do with Nintendo because they did guest characters with Fire Emblem originally for Fire Emblem Awakening and there's a lot more that they can put in there with Noah now. and Mio baby yeah <laughs> Noah and Mio because yeah we had um um 
Cosmos and um, right. Gosh, I, Shion, I forgot right? the other one. What was that? Was she on in, in with Cosmos or? No, I can't remember. I, was no? she? Okay. I forget. I can't remember. <laughs> I can't point. remember. <laughs> but yeah, you could just introduce more characters from those series and just kind of, you know, flesh that out from what we had beforehand. And there was there was just a lot of stuff about that that I enjoyed. Uh, a lot of fan service between character interactions. And I think you could do a lot more with that now. So give me give me more Monster Hunter in the next one so that Brandon has a reason to buy it. Uh make make Rathalos a character and his only dialogue is just roaring. But people have conversations <laughs> with him. I would eat that right up. <laughs> oh, it was Fiora with Cosmos. That's right. Thank you, Harrow. It was Fiora. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I I would love to see another Project Cross Zone. I I'd love. Uh, I'll still like fire up videos once in a while of all the X and Zeros tag team attacks. They look the sprite animation in that game is obviously amazing, but they look so cool doing their team up attacks in that game. And yeah, I'd love to see them return in like an HDified. Project oh, Cross yeah. 3. That would be so cool. Um, but uh, and also Bolt Mouse X says Pyra and Mithra and Project Cross Project Cross and imagine that. That would be so cool. Hell yeah. Um, my answer for this, well, my, my easy cheating answer would be would be Hi-Fi Rush because I just love that game to death. But that's too recent. That's too easy. So yes, I want a Hi-Fi Rush too. But my deeper cut answer is Bravely Second. No, Bravely Default 2 does not count. It was such a disappointing follow-up. And then it wasn't really even a follow-up. It was just its own self-contained story. And I just didn't think it was, I thought it was a step down from Bravely Second myself. But if you know, if you played Bravely Second, it ends on a major cliffhanger. And I want a Bravely Third so badly. It came out nine years ago at this point. We're never going to get it. Um, apparently it was poorly received in some circles to the point that Square Enix even apologized. They're like, we're sorry we disappointed you with Bravely Second. We're going to do better next time. And I'm like... I don't know what y'all are talking about. I love Bravely Second. So I don't think we're ever going to get the proper sequel that I'd like to see, but um, that would be my pick. Bravely Second is probably my second favorite 3DS game ever, uh, right behind Kid Icarus Uprising. It just absolutely captivated me. And uh, I want a sequel so badly, um, but I don't think we're ever going to get one. So yeah, Bravely Second would be my would be my pick. But uh, I don't know why, why it didn't land with some people, but yeah, say la vie. Uh, thank you for that topic, Vedron. Uh, Steve, how about you? How about you go next, man? Yeah, uh, my topic this week comes from Cutie Caitlin. Uh, Cutie Caitlin wrote, "Just got my PAX media badge. First one, first, first one time getting a media badge. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm reading it as it's written. I promise. Uh, first time getting a media badge and going to a gaming con. What were your first big cons? Um, oh, I didn't answer Vedron's. Or wait, did I? I don't know." I did. What? No, no. Yeah, Brandon answered Vedron's. Okay, sorry. No, Vedron was asking if I answered their their topic. I can't oh. remember if I. What was you their did topic? right? You did answer the question. Yeah, you answered it. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I you, said arms. Okay. Arms. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I thought. Yeah. Like I was like, wait. Anytime you someone questions off, me, chat. <laughs> you broke me. You broke me. All right. Uh. Anyway, Caitlin just got her first media badge. Um. What were our first big cons? Well, I think I know everybody's, but mine. Uh, was PAX West, or as it was known then, Prime. Um, and, and I have a good story about this one. So I got my first media badge for Kotaku's uh, user-run blog, which was called Talk Amongst Yourselves. And in in my uh, fervor to get in, I, I decided I wanted to walk around the expo hall and like see what I could see. And I was with a friend. Uh, his name is Ben he now writes books and runs a memory card podcast with Push Dustin. Uh, we were walking oh, along and cool. Ben had just bought his badge and I decided to apply for a media badge just being like, I'll get it. And if I don't, I won't go. <laughs> and so I got the badge and we were walking along and I saw that they were still setting up booths and I was like, I'm going to go in there. And, and Ben was like, don't do that. You'll get in trouble. I was like, what's the worst thing they're going to do? Tell me to leave and then I'll just leave. And so I went in and I just walked around PAX for like two hours watching like Nintendo <laughs> set up their booth and watching nice. other people do stuff. Nobody questioned any of what I was doing. <laughs> um, and my, my, my favorite bit of that was that my very first day on the show floor during media hour, because PAX has an hour where if you have a media badge, you get uninterrupted access. I walked up to Kit and Krista, who are now, you know, doing what we do. And I was like, 
hey, uh, when's the offsite thing? I didn't know anything about any offsite Nintendo activity. I was just like, hey, when's the offsite? And they were like, oh, yeah, it's over here. Here's the details. Gave it to me. And that's how I met Ash Paulson. Because I walked in, right. pretended I was supposed to be there, and played Smash while he was recording footage. I forgot. That's <laughs> Yeah, that's I forgot that's the, the event we originally met at. That's so great. Yep, I, love I lied that. my way into that. And the best oh, part is uh, the guy who was doing PR, I won't give his name out just because Nintendo fans can be weird sometimes. But he was sitting at the desk, and he goes, he looks me in the eye clocks who i am and goes you weren't invited and then i said yeah i talked to kit he told me to come here and let me in and he's like i don't care <laughs> just let me through <laughs> that's so good oh, that's so that's how my career lore. started be bold <laughs> this is <laughs> the, the worst. steve bowling lore <laughs> That's such a great origin story. I love that. I I had completely forgotten that that uh, because I remember I remembered meeting you there, of course, but I just forgot that that was the first time we actually yeah we actually met. So that's crazy. Yeah, it, it, it all worked out. Caitlin says Steve Bolding, very very apt, very apt for sure. Uh, what about you, Brandon? E three twenty nineteen. Okay, the one and only E three I ever had, made it to. You had a media badge for that? I wasn't media. I was just there. Oh, okay. oh, right. She she did just ask, what were your first big cons? Yeah, that's where I met Brandon Brandon Miracle. Yeah, I, I met all you guys there. That's I right. was a nervous little man. I remember that. <laughs> yep. I was out, outside in front, right? In front of the convention yep. center. Yep, I remember. Mm -hmm. I also, that's the one and only physical interaction I've ever had with John. I hope to remedy that. <laughs> I know. We got to get him back out for a pack. I still haven't we really seen do. it all. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was just a really great experience for me. Um spent uh went to a party at roger's place uh played smash with uh you guys including ash ate all his right. pizza before he showed up that's right there was no pizza left by the time i got there <laughs> so sorry about that um <laughs> still <but> yeah about <laughs> it was nice to get to experience e3 when i did because uh obviously that's never gonna happen again man uh, r.i.p and then, so Daniel, I know obviously you didn't get to go to E3, unfortunately, which I just absolutely hate for you. But what was your first convention? First convention was in the year 2008. I was with, um, I was in, I, I brought up my little academy before. I used to go to high school with a separate school inside of it. That's where I learned graphic design, all that other stuff that I, I do now for you guys. And the coolest field trip we ever took in that academy was going to a place, a uh, convention called WonderCon in San Francisco. Ooh. This was back when it used to be located in San Francisco at the Moscone Center. And um, it was the first time I ever even knew what a convention was at, of, of any sort. And there was like a small group of us that was there. One of my friends, who's a total nerd, went and cosplayed as Ryu, the only one of, of our group that looked like it. So we we're just like, yeah, he, he's with us. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I walked around. It, it showed just a lot of boots on uh anime comic book culture a little bit of everything that was there and i, I was like oh my god these things exist there was booths that has selling imported games from japan and i was like i've never seen this before i is how do these happen often <laughs> and that introduced me to like the whole culture of, of conventions I, i've gone there i went there every year past that while it was still uh, uh, there but then the moscone center was undergoing construction and so they moved it down to so southern california where it, did, where it performed a lot better and so they, they just kept it there and i haven't been to WonderCon since um but that's that little that little story there the first actual like big convention with amongst you know the gaming circle is with you guys was pax west in the year 2022 i think 21 21, 21. I think. Mm. yeah that was the first that oh was the yeah first the first one after the first lockdown one. Yeah, because right. it was, like, super empty that year. Right, Super yeah. creepy packs, and then 22 was good, yeah. <laughs> super creepy packs. And oh, man, our... it was like a, all of PAX was a liminal space in 2021. It, it was a ghost town. It really was, and I'll yeah. never forget that Verbo that we were all cooped up in that was just incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, yeah. We had wait, to, wait. like, move... I remember pushing the laptop against the windows so <gasps> yeah, right. proper internet. Oh, was I loved that Verbo. <laughs> oh, you did? <laughs> Oh, oh man, it was Sleeping perfect. Sleeping on the floor was was, it, was not it, man. Every I, every 
Congo or needs at least one story like that though. Well, that's you're I not. Think, at I those... think because I've had so many that I'm just like I was done with sleeping on the floor by that point. Yeah, that that was that was really a great time because I mean that's where I met this whole panel here for the first time was right. at that PAX and and it was the the birth of certain things like me and Brandon have any idea to to actually reboot the Twitch channel and rebrand it for us uh, for Good Vibes Arcade. Right. And yeah, just getting to know you all. I was. That's when I started to actually appear on camera. I, I was on TNT one time before. That was the only time I was on camera. But then we did, you know, live shows from that same Verbo uh, for the next few days. And that's where I started to show up more often on videos. And I right. feel a little more comfortable doing so to the point where here I am now. And, yeah, that was just – that's that's the major one, honestly, is when I got to meet all you guys and kind of work a show. So hope we can do that again soon, too. I know. I really want to do a show. Usually, I'm the I'm the main convention guy. I, I usually am the one who ends up going to all the packs and stuff. And sometimes y'all are able to join me, but I would love love to really properly do a full team convention at some point, whether it's packs or Summer Game Fest isn't really a convention that doesn't really count. But I just like I'd love to do a packs with the whole team one one day. I don't know if it can happen, want, but it'd be so great. I want to try and do packs east. I still haven't been there, and I want to go there this year. I, I might it has be able to be to. east for me. I can't do West. I know anymore. you can't do West at all. <laughs> well, yeah. like I said, I just got approved for my badge, Daniel. So if you can uh, go, let me know. We can get you one too. So. Oh man. Can, yeah. Uh, make it happen. If I, if I can accrue the, uh, the, the funds needed, I will yeah. fly out there and see. You yeah. I got to figure out my rooming situation. That's my thing. Yeah. I got to figure out who I'm rooming with. Oh, geez. Um, yeah. So my first convention, so technically my first convention was like, I don't even know what year, but I used to go to San Diego Comic-Con every year with my dad because he would be called down there for, you know, very, you know, voice acting stuff and he'd be on panels. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of a tradition, a tradition that I would go with him and just hang out with him at Comic-Con. So that's technically my first convention experience. And I knew from an early age that I just loved the convention experience, the convention culture just from going to San Diego Comic-Con, probably from when I was like eight, nine years old. But in terms of like uh, covering a convention or covering a show professionally and getting a media badge and, uh, and such, I'm really aging myself when I say this and it hurts to even think it. But my first professional convention was E3 1999. And uh, that was when Square, not Square Enix, but Square Soft, they were demoing Final Fantasy VIII at their booth. Oh no! And, uh, yep, I'll never forget it. That was my first E3. That was back when Square had like their enclosed video theater at their booth, where you had to wait in line and then you get treated to like a bunch of exclusive trailers showing upcoming games. They don't do that anymore. Well, obviously not because E3's gone. But you know, for the last several years of E3, they didn't do that. They just had an open seating theater, but they used to have a closed one where you had to get in line and wait for like hours to get in and see like their lineup of upcoming trailers and stuff. But yeah, I remember waiting in line at my very, for that trailer experience, waiting in line at E3 1999, demoing Final Fantasy VIII. And <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm really aging myself, but I was lucky. I got to, I got to cover like, what, probably 15 E3s over the years or something. I went to, a, I don't know, over 10 for sure. Uh, but that was my very first one and uh, somehow got in, even though, uh, you know, as a working journalist, it's supposed to be 18 or over. I was able to get in not being 18. I don't remember exactly how that happened, but I got like a special exception. I don't even remember how, but be that as it may, I cover it was for a, a website that's no longer around. It's defunct now, but I was working writing for a gaming website at the time and I covered E3 1999 for them. So whew, makes Bro. me feel old. <laughs> what? I was five. <laughs> I hate you. You didn't. You didn't need to. Oh, you didn't need to add that on there. You didn't. You didn't need to give me that detail. That was not kindergarten. <laughs> that detail was not needed, Brandon. Thank you for that. Was that. nine. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw it in there. I, Steve, you know I'm. I know you know how I'm feeling right now. Oh, you I know do. the pain. I do. You I'm know the... counting the gray hairs in my beard right now. It's, uh, it's fine. Steve, Steve knows the pain I'm in. Brandon, <laughs> I've already got a, a plot picked out, man. <laughs> Nice. It's so, reserved. Yeah, oh, I pre-ordered it. I'm like, whatever Nintendo. <laughs> I don't know which I'm getting first: into a hole in the ground or a Switch Two. But they're around the same time for me, it seems. Oh, Spending man. those and PlayStation then... Stars points on that. <laughs> I know. Right? Both, both coming with that physical release. <laughs> of course. So see, well, look what you've started, guys. Now we've got YouTube chat telling us how young they are, how young they were in 1999. See, what have you started? We're, now I have to know. We're... 
<laughs> Were you born yet, audience? <laughs> oh, moving on. <laughs> Thank you, I think, for that topic, Caitlin. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brandon, or sorry. Uh, yeah. No, D Daniel, you're up next. Sorry, man. Okay, let's see here. Um, mine is from Disney Duncan asking, GVG, how is Tears of the Kingdom compared to Breath of the Wild the way Majora's Mask is to Ocarina of Time? Do you think the, sequel the sequels impacted the originals? Um, it's interesting to look back at those because them as sequels could not be any more different from each other. Because Majora's Mask was made in a year's time following Ocarina of Time. The world is completely different. There are reused assets, but it's completely like unique and doesn't really borrow anything from Ocarina of Time, even like to mechanics of how you know you spend your days, because the three-day cycle, of course. And then you have something like Tears of the Kingdom, which spent six something years uh developing in a world that we've already visited before, with uh obviously brand new mechanics like with Ultra Hand with all those uh, unique abilities that are, are only in that game. But I don't know. It, it's funny because that, Tears of the Kingdom, it feels like it's not going to stay as with stay with me as much as Breath of the Wild will because the unique experience of Breath of the Wild is so much its own thing. Like I think we all can remember the feeling of exiting the shrine for the first time and being like, wow, this is absolutely a different kind of Zelda game from before. And even though I kind of retreaded that with Tears of the Kingdom, it didn't have that same kind of impact the second time around, even though like it's still a fantastic game in itself. Um, Majora's Mask really kind of just separates itself from Ocarina of Time as much as possible, despite being so closely connected, even visually, and with the assets that they use, um, the kind of message that it says, the kind of story that it tells, it's so much different than beforehand. And... I think it's it's hard to compare the two because like Tears of the Kingdom really does kind of follow the same beats and how they tell the story. Um, going to four locations, getting these memories uh, to kind of tell the story in pieces that isn't really, you know, in the same kind of timeline that you're playing the game in. And so, yeah, it's I mean, this is a whole discussion I could do uh, beyond this. But what do, what do you guys think comparing the two as sequels? It's, it's tough because like with Majora's Mask, you don't need ocarina of time for that game to be what it is uh but tears of the kingdom like i don't know it's it's like standing on breath of the wild shoulders right uh even though the experience of coming out of the shrine in breath of the wild isn't exactly replicated with tears of the kingdom i still remember falling out of the sky for that first time landing in the hyrule and just feeling like i was never here before because it's familiar, but everything's different. Um, mm. With Majora's Mask, like, it's a boy being whisked away to another dimension. Um, sure, the characters look like the characters from Ocarina of Time, but I don't think you even really need that necessarily for that game's impact to land, if that makes sense. Yeah, just because there was so much that people were comparing to Breath of the Wild with Tears of the Kingdom, just because there was like an expectation also of how are they going to, you know, reinvigorate this style going into the sequel. And Majora's, Majora's Mask didn't really have that, I, I don't think, because it definitely was like its own thing and it separated itself enough that it didn't have that kind of like, oh, how much is this going to be like Ocarina of Time? Because as people started, it had a completely different like formula as, it, as, they, as they started to play it more. See, now... I'm, I'm going to disagree, uh, and maybe this is the benefit of age, uh, because I was I was existent when these when Ocarina and Majora dropped, right? Like I was right. I was following these uh, as a somebody who's older than I care to mention. But uh, so to me, uh, Majora's Mask and Tears of the Kingdom are thematically extremely different i agree on that front but i think tonally there are enough similarities to where i understand the comparison being made uh because the like brandon implied when you land in hyrule from tears of the kingdom you know it's the same but you also get that kind of sense like things are off things have changed yeah. uh and i think that that's that's a key tone that exists in majora's mask as well like like you guys were talking about, the characters look the same, but they're not the same. Everything's askew. And when you think about the development cycle of both of these games, granted, yeah, six years is 
friggin' wild, but I think now that we've played Tears of the Kingdom, we all kind of understand where a lot of that time went. Um, you know, when you see developers being like, how did they do this? I'm like, okay, I, I guess six years is reasonable. Um, yeah. So... To me, that's kind of, I think it went more into the technical level of polish ra as opposed to conceptual planning, um, especially because if you rewind way back and I've been hiding this little Nintendo nugget of information in my pocket for like six months because I want to find a way to work it into a video, uh, the, the diving mechanic is one of the first things Nintendo figured out in Breath of the Wild's development. So if you rewind way back, they did... Um, they did a presentation in which they banned people from whipping out their phones, which of course made people do exactly that and of record course. it. <laughs> the very first map that they created before they had Hyrule was like an actual working uh, model of a castle in Kyoto somewhere. And they, I remember, and Link right. had the ability to skydive into that world and the animations are one for one the same. <laughs> Like the the wow. video shows Link arms spread, legs spread, descending, same camera angle they used in Tears of the Kingdom. So they had these ideas that they just couldn't use, and I I think that there's a lot of that DNA shared between Ocarina uh, and Majora and Breath of the Wild and Tears, in which they had these concepts that just didn't fit, and they made a whole new game to fit some of those ideas together into something that that is. Uh, while while there's kind of a little bit different, it, it's God damn it, Ezra. <laughs> they're they're uh, they're they're still kind of a similar vibe in that like we have assets and we're gonna build a whole new thing out of all this existing stuff we've made and just shake it up to where it it's equal parts familiar and and new if that makes sense. I'm totally. I mean, uh, no, 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 totally. And that that's kind of what I was gonna touch on is more of the the technological development history aspect of how these sequels exist the way they do. Like literally Tears of the Kingdom and Majora's Mask would not exist in the form they do if not for Ocarina of Time and Breath of the Wild because of a lot of what you just said, Steve. Like they were literally developed at, you know, obviously the both sequels reuse quite a few assets, but they, but not for one for one. Like, yeah, the characters are, are the same, but there's something off. There's something like everything is a little bit askew, like you said. So I mean, the two, the relationship between both games and their sequels can't be understated. I mean, literally, these sequels would not exist in the form they do without Ocarina of Time and Breath of the Wild being what they are. And I think that they can both, like, kind of as you were touching on, Brandon, they can both have their own levels of impact. Yes, Breath of the Wild was more impactful in its time because we'd never quite seen an open-world game done like that before. And Tears of the Kingdom was, in some in many ways, shapes, and forms, iterative. But that didn't mean that landing in Hyrule for the first time in Tears of the Kingdom was any less impactful in its own way. And things were just different enough that it made it you know, feel really new and, and fresh and exciting again. And yeah, I don't think the relationship between these games and their sequels can be, you know, this is this would be a great discussion for a video, honestly. Yes. It would be a great, yeah, great discussion video. Just really, really mine this topic because there's a lot, I think, here to unpack that we don't, have time for in the in the context of a GVG cast, but yeah, I mean, I I don't want to ramble. I agree with pretty much everything you guys just said, and I as you I told you, Steve, I was going to kind of lean on the technological development history aspect of it with regard to asset reuse and iterating on what came before for these sequels. So, yeah, this is a great topic. Thank you for that, Duncan. This is uh, and I, if we need to do a video on this, this is yeah, fun. I, th I think the main difference between that to, to to realize between these games is that. Um, there was a lot of ideas in Breath of the Wild that they wanted to put into Tears of the Kingdom that they didn't have time for, and so they had a lot of time to implement that. Uh, Majora's Mask was the opposite, in which it didn't have a lot of time. They had to really crunch a lot of things in, and so they had to make what make do with what they had. And so some of the stuff that you see, like for example, the Fierce Deity's Mask was supposed to be more of like a traditional become adult Link uh, that you could use and, and travel the world around with that. But then they had to, you know, they would have to implement a lot of stuff like changing how. Link would animate, like getting into buildings. He had to duck or something, and that's what they didn't have time for. So a lot of it was just time crunch, and then and those ideas kind of became uh, the game that we we see now today in Majora's Mask. While Tears of the Kingdom, they had like a whole year to polish, <laughs> give themselves a year to make things polish as they could be. So I think, yeah, I mean, obviously both super impactful, and um, they definitely don't like hinder the original experience that you see in 
you know, Breath of the Wild or Ocarina of Time, of course. But yeah, I mean, of course, this is something we could talk about for <laughs> for a while, one way or another. For sure. Yeah, this would be this would be a fun discussion video for sure. Well, thank you for that. Have we all said our piece on this before we move on? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for that, Duncan. Great topic again. Really, seriously, thank you. And then, okay, for uh, for the last topic today, this is my topic from our sponsor, the Couch Kids. So, thank you for this topic, Couch Kids. What is a recent, current, or past game industry rumor that you would like to see come true in 2024? Let's go, GVG fam. Well, thank you very much, Couch Kids. And uh, four words: Star Fox Grand Prix. Obviously, we <laughs> know what's never a real thing, but I wish it was. Right? Wouldn't that have been the coolest thing? <sighs> it's it, it, I remember it sharing similarities with Diddy Kong Racing, and that's like preaching to the choir, baby. I know. <laughs> like, that's exactly what I want. I so, wanted yeah. that to be. I know. I, I think we eventually found out that it was a plant, just to, to to weed out some leakers. That it was never actually a real thing. But man, there's whole, when there's no when, gaming video about it. <laughs> right, right. But when we first heard about it, and we didn't know that at the time, I wanted so badly, so badly for it to be real. It, it was weird how that made rounds uh, because I remember hearing from people within the industry that they had played it. And I'm like, how did you get there? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, lots of, lots of weird stuff around that. Um, I guess I'm going to jump in with mine because I'm here now. Um, it would be uh, the long rumored remasters of Twilight Princess and Ocarina of Time or, and Wind Waker. Sorry for the switch. Oh, Where, okay. what happened to those? I just want them, please. That's it is so pocket. odd that we don't. I feel like they're just waiting that, that Nintendo's just sitting on them, that they're done, right? They're already done. They're just probably gonna, it's just gonna go to the next console at this point. This is, yeah, get some Zelda's I think on there. Swan Song games, maybe for Switch, like because we still we don't have a full like vision for the rest of the year yet, and I you could easily throw something like that in the summer when nothing See, else comes out. I actually agree with Daniel on this one. I think that they are for switch Two now. And the reason I think that, mm -hmm. and I, I mean, when you think about tears of the kingdom having completed, right, we just got that last year and it took them six years to make that with Hyrule already existing, like basically a bolted on new Zelda. It's going to take them at least six years to make a whole cloth new Zelda. And so what are they going to do? With Switch 2 presumably launching this year and at least another three to four years of development time remaining on a, a new mainline Zelda, they've got to fill those gaps with something. And so I honestly think as part of the launch lineup for Switch 2, they're like, okay, Zelda 2-pack, here you go. You right. We're launching with a Mario and a Zelda. First year is done. That'll buy us some time. I still think we're waiting also on... Uh some kind of top down or I don't want to yep. call it a secondary Zelda, but something of, of that type. Sure, Rezo hasn't so. released anything recently outside of a mobile game. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what are they doing? Well, Get right hand something to them. I've long believed that Nintendo is going to adopt their Mario strategy for Zelda. And we already know that they take those, those 2d games and they have what the it, more fledgling developers, like people who are new to it. They have them work on the 2d Mario games. And then eventually they graduate to the AAA 3D Mario teams. And I, I'm willing to bet that they're trying to build a talent pipeline like that for Zelda as well. So I, I, I agree. I think we'll see something that it, I, I would never call it lesser than, but like a 2D Zelda for developers to get their feet wet yeah. with the franchise. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Caitlin, thank you for the uh, for the clarification, by the way. It was not a plant. I forgot. It's been a while since I've seen the Digino Gaming video on it. But yes, it was it was not a plant. Thank you for the clarification on that. Um, Wataniac, also a great one. The Chorus Kids and Smash from the Gamatsu League. They were apparently in at one point, And I wish that could have come true. That's a really good one. Oh, um, God, I would have loved that. I could easily do an hour on the smoke surrounding Smash right now. There, oh, there's, I know. There's right? a fire there. Um, oh my you know, another one that just came to my mind while we were talking, and, and this is it's kind of been a, I see everyone saying like, Bolt Mouse, you said Mega Man Legends 3, but that's not a rumor. It was a thing and then got canceled. X9 was never a rumor as far as I know. But one that just came to mind is that there have been whispers of Square wanting to do a Final Fantasy X-3. And I want that so bad. I would love nothing more than for them to announce this year that FF X-3 is actually a thing. I think that would be so freaking cool. 
Um, but it's just whispers right now, just rumors. But I would love to see that come true. I don't think we've heard from Daniel at all. No, we haven't. <laughs> we, we've been dominating yeah. for a while. I mean, it's not too hard to assume what I would guess. Um, I'm still waiting on these talks I've been having for years about remaking Genealogy of the Holy War for Fire Emblem. Um, that's Japan's most beloved Fire Emblem game. And we still don't have like like any more echoes after Shadows of Valencia. Like that's something they can easily do is, is go back to some of the older titles. That one in Thracia, both are still games that we are waiting for uh, at some point, hopefully. Um, another one I kind of wanted to... Th- I, I hadn't brought up in a while, or at all, actually. Uh, since we're getting Metal Gear Solid uh, Delta, Snake Eater, uh, I'm pretty sure there were also rumors of the same of a team, maybe the same team, working on the original uh, remake. And that would be really cool to see the, the original Metal Gear Solid have its its remake. Because back then, what a what a cinematic achievement <laughs> that was back then, uh, playing the original on PS1. And if we have another one, if we have the um, original return in that same format that would be that would just be so cool because I, I understand why they would do sneak eater first because it's kind of essentially a, a prequel to what we got um with Metal Gear solid two and three but yeah i think, think that would be something that we'd love to see if, if rumors are to be believed <laughs> that would be really cool yeah i hadn't i mean i hadn't even thought about that that's a good one uh brandon have you weighed in on this yet i can't remember I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think you have. I don't. Steve and I kind of dominated the first part of this one. So yeah. What about you, man? Hmm. There was a. I, I vaguely remember. I, I was going to say Star Fox Grand Prix, but thinking even deeper, am I incorrect in recalling a rumor long time ago about a Metroid Star Fox crossover? Oh. Hmm. Was there? Was there? I'm, I'm talking sure. like. A long time ago. This seems vaguely familiar. I can't remember if I'm making it up. That was at the start (laughs) of the Wii U era. God. So says the start of the Wii U era. I'm pretty sure that was a thing. I think it was. There's so many things around like Metroid and Star Fox and like Retro Studios that kind of blends together for me at this point. Oh, yeah. Okay, I I found it. May 19th, 2012, IGN. Rumor, Star Fox and Metroid teaming up on Wii U. I just saw it, found it, too. That's right, Star Fox Metroid Fusion Saga. Yeah, I just liked the whole idea of that, because Nintendo in space, like, if we're doing, like, a shared (laughs) universe, anything can happen in space. Who cares? They're, They're aliens, whatever. Kirby, Samus, Star Fox, do Captain whatever Olimar. you want. Exactly. <laughs> Amazing. God, that would be so cool. Yeah. Oh my God. Samus just firing Pikmin out of her arm cannon at people. <laughs> I just think there's a lot of potential there because there really is no limitation. It's in space. You can believe whatever you want. My suspension of disbelief, who cares? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to I be just... canon to anything. Just go wild with it. Yeah. yeah. I just want to see what would happen. There was a Metroid in Samus's gunship in Donkey Kong Country Returns, so you know they're all they're all sneakily connected somehow. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> yep. That's. I'm so glad you reminded of that the, us of that, Brandon. I had completely forgot about that rumor. I wish it was true. That's a great one. I'm glad I didn't make that up. I was pretty sure that was a yeah. thing at one point. It was a dream he had one time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> man, no, I, that would be so cool. I have to put this out there, Ash, for both of us. Okay. Um, technically. I, I think at this point, uh, we've seen most of the stuff from that NVIDIA leak come to pass in some way, shape, or form. I want my damned Chrono Trigger remake, please. Well, I, that wasn't in the NVIDIA leak. Was I'm pretty sure it, it was. was. FF9 and FF Tactics. I don't think Chrono Trigger was in there. I'm almost certain Chrono Trigger was in the NVIDIA wait, leak. If it, there's no... Wait, what? Oh, no. I'm an idiot. It was oh. Chrono Cross. Oh. And yeah, we did like, get that. I, there was, like, there's no way I wouldn't have known and like not pop the hell off about that if that was in that league. Okay, uh, I was, wait a minute. How all right, I'm making that? up a new rumor. Chrono Trigger's <laughs> coming out in 2024. Uh, Make it happen, Squeenix. Right? On that note, though, I mean, FF9 and Tactics were part of that leak, and uh, that would be really exciting to see those come about for sure. And Chrono Cross did technically happen. Yeah. Uh, I wish, I wish Chrono Trigger remake was Chrono Trigger's coming. You what? 
I said somebody call up Jeff Grubb and tell him to say Chrono Trigger's coming. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he said I, the same I, thing yeah. about Twilight Princess, and we still don't have it. So, <laughs> yeah, Grubb, yeah. I'm counting on you. He's playing the long game. <laughs> yeah, eventually he'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much to the Couch Kids for not only your sponsorship, of course, but for that awesome topic. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're just about done with episode 88 of the GBG cast, but we did get one more super chat that came in a little while back from our good friend Aramis Baramis with $20. Thank you so much, saying just wishing for a great cast. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you. Always thank you. really appreciate your generosity, and I'm looking forward to continuing our Fight of Founder sessions of uh, Flower, Sun, and Rain this month with you. I'm very much looking forward to that so uh i'm super glad you introduced me to the silver case what a cool game now we're doing flower sun and rain and i am looking forward to continuing that with you so thank you aramis and with that said we're done we've reached the end of episode 88 of the gvg cast thank you so much for hanging out with us every week you know we love doing this with you all uh as always we have to give a special shout out to all of our patrons at the producer tier and above for helping to make what we do here happen we couldn't keep the lights on without you so thank you so very much and as always, we have to give an extra special shout out to all of our patrons at the executive producer tier and above. And those fine, amazing, wonderful folks include Brandon Bovia, Cutie Caitlin, Fangs, Z Patty, Sky Blue Flames, Eastman23, Adam O'Sullivan, Richard Herrera, Logan Daniel, The D Pad, Blake, Joy Content, Angel Martinez, Vedron, Joshua Hunter, Benny Yao, Azran127. Black King, Joseph Rutkin, Geeky Griffin, Lucky Wonderfish, Wataniac, Top Dog 23100, Young Ben Kenobi, The Couch Kids, Andrew Medeiros, Darchi, Becca, Ikaro, Dark B Andy, Esax08, Michael McCaw, Matthew Wong, Goron Amber CPHT, Too Much Spaghetti, Bane 400, Ascaron 809, Ryaner, Rain and Clouds, The Game Orb, Super Gamer Dude 101, Mercury, Ravelox, Rosa Pardo Bowling. Hi, Mom. Dark Steel 01, Jason Uloa, Jaden Buck, Cystic Warrior 29, DJ Jurassic, Super Dank Awesome Unicorn Guy, Derek, Colin, Blaze Star 25, Twilord, Mumbling Yeti, Cameron Sharp, Keel, Brendan Hesse, Hustlebun, Noah Fitterer, Calvin Atkinson, Brainchild, the entire state of Wisconsin, Jim Wakelin, Zlaker, Aramis Baramis, Kyle the Monarch, Dat Alpha Lion, Lord Metarex, Blaze Collard, Eric, Cat EV Person 5, Peyton Thiel, Mega Beatman True Blue Reviews, Ryan Hanley, The Game Jamie, and last but certainly not least, Zombie joe thank you all so very much we're heading out to our patron exclusive post show we will talk to you soon have a great weekend and uh a lovely 2024 good night and good vibes bye, bye see everyone. ya till we meet again